me and my wife, we bought a house there uh, quite some time ago. And in buying a house in Provence, you know you're going to be doing restoration works for years and years and years. This way? I would be nothing without <laughs> saying. Um, he knows about poets that they're on the hands like this. Um, and in this village, uh, well, we found the house somewhere, and you see that on top of the wall, a rock wall of 100 meters, there's an 11th century tower. Underneath are still the ruins of a chapel. And where you see the village now, this is the village now, you have the valley where there's a river, the Nesk. And above the houses was the medieval village, where you now see trees and rocks. So now the ruins of the old village. Now, I had heard talking in the village, each year again, about a treasure. They, they were talking about a treasure, a village is called Monyu. Everybody was talking about the, the treasure of Monyu. It's a legend. Some people say it's up there in the rocks, others say it's somewhere in a cave, others say it's deep in the valley at the river. A nice legend. You, you, a legend should be uh, somewhere where you cannot find it, because if you can find it, it's the end of the legend. <laughs> so, nice legend. And the other and I heard people talking about a Jewish cemetery, but nobody knew what it was. And then at a certain time after, I think, eight years, one of my neighbors, a German, that's how it is in the Provence villages, the neighbors are Swiss and Spanish and German, and no, the French are in the center of the village. I heard talking about a manuscript and about a, a, in Chicago, a professor, who in the 1960s had explained a document of a thousand years old. And <clears throat> here it is. It's a, see how beautiful it is. After years of research, I've held it in my hands and it was really for me a very emotional thing. Because then I had the one thing in my hands, this woman from a thousand years ago has been wearing on her body. <coughs> um, in this manuscript, the rabbi says, Jewish community, wherever in the world, held this poor woman. She's of Christian descendants. She's high-born. She fell in love with the son of the rabbi of Narbonne in the south of France. She married him. When there were six months in Narbonne and she was pregnant, the knights of her father were looking for her. So they fled to my small village. And this is the view from my window. And this is how the book begins, that I see them coming through my window. I had to write the book there. I couldn't write it in Brussels or in Belgium. I had to be really in this historical, timeless landscape where you see not much can change. You have such landscapes in Croatia as well. And I started researching where the girl could have come from. It took me almost two years to find out of almost certainty where she came from. And then my real research began to, to start, because then I could imagine who she had been. And since the letter telling her life has been found back in Egypt, in Cairo, in a synagogue, I thought, this girl comes from somewhere in the north of France. She goes to Nabon. She lives for six years in my village. And then her letter of recommendation saying that a man has been killed in the synagogue of Monia, that her children have been taken away by the crusaders, that she's in tears, and that nobody can help her anymore. And the rabbi asking, help this poor woman. And this letter being found in Cairo, I thought, what has happened? And this is where it all started. Obično se ne čuvaju dokumenti o običnim ljudima, dakle, povijest čuva dokumente uglavnom o nekim velikim, važnim ličnostima. Kako ste se čuvali dokument, kako, kako se ovaj dokument koji ste držali i mogli da takmiti, da se čuvali? Um, this is a thrill in itself. From the 19th century on, in this side of God, travelers, because tourism begins with late colonialism, Tourists passing by, having intellectual formation, know that in this synagogue, if you give a bakshis, the rabbi will sell you a few little documents, a shrubs, paper, very old. It's 
stuff. More and more people begin to know about this. The Grand Uncle of Heinrich Heine was there in 1879. And he already said, there is something in this synagogue that they are hiding. And they sell manuscripts of very great value. In 1888, two British women come back from an out cruise. We were already an out cruise in the 19th century. And they come back. And they go to the rabbi, the great rabbi at the University of Cambridge. And they ask him, look, we bought for a few manuscripts in synagogue. Can you read it? And he sees the first manuscript and he says, this is a Jewish page of the Greek Ecclesias. This is lost. Where have you got it? Oh, we bought it for a batches. Do you have other documents? Oh, yes, they have. They give a second document, a poem by Yehuda ben Khalevi, 11th century poet that nobody had ever seen. He says, what is it? And the third document was a page from Maimonides. So he said, okay. I go there. What this man, Solomon Schechter, found there was almost 300,000 documents. The Jews put their documents on which there are the four sacred letters, J, H, W, H, Yahweh. Each document, whether it be a ticket for a boat, or it be a testimony for a marriage, or something about buying a house, or whatever, if the sacred tetra letter is on it, you cannot waste you put it in a wastebasket. It has to be thrown by the rabbi through a hole at the end of the side of the door, through a hole in the wall. But the hole in the wall is one meter away from the really end wall. So there's a sort of dark cave there. He has to go up to the women's gallery and throw it in so it falls deeply to the ground. You can throw it past it. Documents. Normally, after 100 years or something, the rabbi has to bury what is left if it's not eaten by the rats and snakes and scorpions. But those rabbis have been a bit, you know, lazy. <coughs> they never did it. So, what they found there was the greatest treasure ever concerning our knowledge of medieval Jews. And here you see that hero, Solomon Schechter, who bought everything there was. You see him here in between thousands and thousands of old manuscripts. And one is about the girl that lived in my village, which I call my neighbor girl a thousand years ago. TS 16.100. TS and that's the manuscript you've seen. So you can imagine, for me, I'm living in a village um, three or four months a year, uh, me and my wife having our Oh, the paradise of there is a fantastic landscape, it's Provence, it's, it's almost as nice as Croatia. <laughs> um, we love to be there, but of course it also meant that I had imaginations about what happened to my village. And since the manuscript says that there has been a pogrom, there had to be a sign ago. And I had to find where the girl came from. Now I was looking for our life and studying things and researching. And I found out that the same man who has described and analyzed and published the translation of the document you've seen has also been rushing at the end of the 1960s, no, in the 1970s, he has been going to Wuhan. Because in Wuhan in the 1970s, they were trying to excavate for a party for cars under the, the palais of um, the palais de justice, the palais of, what do you call it? The judge, uh, court, the court, under the court. What did they find under the court? This. One of the most beautiful rabbinic schools of the Middle Ages ever found. I read the book of Norman ago, and I grew convinced that this was the most important rabbinic school, or yeshiva, in the north of France in the 11th century for what we call the Ashkenazim. That's Ashkenazim, greatest rabbi school. And I knew from the letter that the girl had fallen in love with the father who was the king of Jews of the 11th century and that he was the rabbi of the greatest Sephardic school. 
So then I thought, such a man sends his son to study to the other great school. In the 11th century, at that time, there was a quarrel. The Sephardic Jews wanted to remain refrained um, polygam. And the Ashkenazim Jews became strictly monogamic. And that period, when they were talking about such topics, they, of course, discussed on the basis of theology, not like we would do on the basis of morality or politics, but on theology. So I thought that's a good basis to know that the guy has gone to the only place he could study was there. And then, of course, I went to Uruguay. I only live three or four hours drive from Uruguay in, in South Brussels. So I went there. The first thing I saw in parking my car and coming out of the parking lot in Rouen was Rue du Massacre, Street of the Massacre. You turn around the corner, and what do you see? Street of the Jews. So I thought, this is where my story begins. And there I decided on the structure of the book, of saying I'm going not only trying to find back what happened to the girl, but I'm going to do the same diaspora. I'll be like her. I'll be the wandering Jew looking for her. That's the structure. That, that's precisely what I want to ask you, uh, 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 Dakle, osim uh, Vigisa de Lajs, uh, vaše junakinje, vaše susjede uh, i njene priče koja je prati na tom njenom zbilja potresnom putovanju, uh, druga nit ove priče, druga nit uh, obraćenice je priča o pisu. Uh, priča o pisu koji je i roman pisac, i esejist, i pjesnika treba uh, vidjeti nešto kao pjesnik, i povjesničar, i detektiv. Dakle, stvari koje ste radili E, koje ste vi radili u ovom romanu e, tiču se svakog od, svake od njih uloga. E, I još sam vas htio pitati, e, to me je podsjetilo dijelo mi na posao koji ste napravili sa slikarom, slikarom i ratom. Također je bila dakle, bilježnice koje ste naslijedili vašeg tjeda koje su 30 godina čekale da ih otvorite i da, i da krenete kreirati taj njegov svijet, svijet čovjeka koji je koji je prvog, da vih od prvog svjetskog rata, koji se vratio iz njega i tako dalje. Ono što sam htio vidjeti je baš metoda. Da li je metoda postojala prije građe, da, da li ste, kad ste ulazili u obraćenicu, znali na koji će te način odključati, ili je građa stvorila metodu. E, Rekli ste mi da svaku svoju knjigu radite u tri, zapravo, u tri kompletna nova, nova pokuša, tri verzije, što se događa na koji način brusite metodu i kako ste došli do ovoga što danas imamo kao obračenicu? Uh, question is about the, the structure, how I came to find it. I think that I am developing in a certain way since War in Turpentine and now in this book and I hope also in the book I'm writing. A bit of my own genre, <coughs> which is I do not want to be in writing historical novels. I do not want to be the old-fashioned god author who knows everything about his characters, like a puppet on a string. I want to be a character among my characters. And you see me as a narrator in those books, as somebody running around in the world of his protagonists. This means that I do not only find a story to write about, but that you are reading two books at once, you're reading the story, and you're reading the making of. And the making of and the story run parallel. That's a nice experiment in a called postmodern form for me to say, okay, I'm not a classical historian, historian, sorry, novel writer. Uh, I'm in a certain way existentially implied. There is always, as you were suggesting, some autobiographic element. In the first, it's clear. In writing a book about the First World War in Flanders, which had never been written before, I was just following the testimony of my grandfather. But as Nabokov says, never trust the writer. If you would see the diaries of my grandfather and my version, of course, I've, I've made my book out of it. But at the same time, I was implied because it's my grandfather, and I live in that 
post post war fragments of today, where again we have nationalistic movements, some movements that want to split up the country, and so on. Not easy times to live in. As to the comfort, of course, it just stupidly happened in the village where I had that house. So, in normally me and my wife, when we go there, we want to be there as fast as we can. So you take the grand, the high roads, and you go there. You go, 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 because you want to be there. It's raining up in the north, as it always does, and you want to be in the south in the sun. And each time you feel a bit guilty, because France is such a wonderful country, and you should better do it on foot. So, in looking for this girl <coughs> from who walked out, I took the smallest roads I could find, sometimes on Google Maps, sometimes on maps in, in my car, and I tried to imagine how they did it. So, in following her, it became my life. In asking myself and passing through the great woods in the center of France, Sauvignon Woods, and seeing there that there are terribly many mosquitoes, I was asking myself, how was that thousand years ago for those refugees who had to sleep in a ditch or in a bar? They were constantly hitting themselves with mosquitoes or what? Did they have, stupid question, good example, did they have mosquito bombs? <laughs> to write that one sentence, it took me a week, but I found it. Yes, they had mosquito bombs. You know who tells us? Hildegard von Bingen, with that apothecary. And this is written, Hildegard was almost contemporary to the girl in my book. So then I know, yes, they had it there, but actually had bombs against mosquitoes. So the more I followed in her traces, the more I had the most crazy questions. When converting to Judaism, how did she change the clothes? I think she started wearing a black robe. Well, of course, we know that the Flemish girls of those days were all sort of broke out and so on. Certainly when they were of high uh, above. So she changes her clothes. Now, I think, now imagine her parents, of whom, after two years, I became aware that probably there were Scandinavians. Because all the important citizens, the patricians, you can't not you cannot speak of bourgeois it's too early. But the patricians of that time were for 90% of Danish descent, whether Normans or Normandy. So I see this girl and I see her parents of Viking descent and the girl changing her clothing. It's like your daughter says, Daddy, I'm going to wear a chamber. I'm in love with the lovely Mohammed. And she said, okay, game changer. How do you react? Was there any vocabulary for this at that time? Apparently not. She just fled with them. But then they're being on the road, and you see the road moving. You see a blonde, blue-eyed girl with a Sephardic boy from Nabon. She's speaking along with Poin, the French of that time, the North. He's speaking along with Duck. She's speaking a mouthful of Scandinavian, maybe, from her grandfather. He's speaking, of course, Spanish, because Nabon was Spanish at the time, and Nabon was under Arab dominance for a part. So, you see, so the language came again, and the multiculturalism. I was only looking for my neighbor girl, and I began to see sort of Europe coming alive, and saying, but well, this is not the Europe I expected to see. A European movement, a Europe of many languages, a France that was absolutely not as coherent as they want to make us believe now. For instance, when you look at the map of France of the 11th century, you can easily see uh, uh, who is in the north, up there, and oh, what did I do? I put it out. Okay. I uh, thought there must be a pointer somewhere too. Okay. Uh, say where's the pointer. That's no point for me. No, no, it's on the other side. No. Ah, so here. If you turn it around, that's the point. You, can, uh -huh. you have seen, he would say it needs some help. Yes, yes. 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 because I put the red light on summer. <laughs> but you see, ladies and gentlemen, these days, uh, publishers are guardian angels to their stupid writers. <laughs> they come from here, Rouen. They go 900 kilometers. 
They certainly do not want Paris. That would have been stupid. They keep west. They go like this. I did it all, 30 kilometers an hour. It was a wonderful trip. They pass the hall, and they come to Novo, here. Then they are found out by the father, who has four or five nights looking for her. Then I thought she must really have been from a rich family. It's as if you and I can pay five police officers in Porsche Cayenne to go to Damascus. Cost a bit of money if you have to look for your daughter. And the daughter must have been a great treasure. She must have been promised to a great night somewhere. And this would have brought honor to the family. So the father and mother must have been enriched. Okay, they flee from here and they go out of France. Because Provence was not France. You see, France was part of the kingdom of Burgundy. And the kingdom of Burgundy fell a bit under the dominance of um, the, the German emperor. And the fourth. So it's an entirely different France where she's moving in. And it was very interesting to see that um, the story of Europe is so complex and is absolutely not what the right wing populists in France or in my country or wherever telling us. It has always been very mixed, it has always been multicultural. And there, uh, of course, were tenses as well. But at that time, there were not as such pogroms and religious wars that began all during the life of this girl for the first crusade. That was the game changer. I ono što ste, ovo što ste upravo opisali, dakle, ovo je prvi je njihov put. Ono što slijedi je još potresnije i još nevjerojatnije. Ono što ga si ja pitao, kažete, Evropa puna pokret. Mi sad, da sad pokušam zamisliti djevojku, mladu ženu koja samo sa djetetom, bez novca, iz Provanse kreće prema Kaju ili prema Jeruzalemu, i to je bio prvi plan, to ni danas ne bi bilo jednostavno. U 11. stoljeću mora da je bilo još nezamislivije nego danas. Vi ste, vi slijedite, dakle, vaš narator, je slijedi u stoku. Nema predah. Ona zapravo ni na jednom mjestu ne može odahnuti. Kratki period koji provodi, srednji period života je u selu o kojem govorimo u nju. Tamo provodi, tamo dobija troje djece i dolazimo do onog jednog trenutka u kojem koji će ponovo izbaciti iz orbite relativno sigurne to je kada dolazi križarska vojska i događa se pogrom u Munijevu. Hoćete nam reći nešto? To je možda ključna epizoda na koji njezina potraga dobija neki drugi smjer. Ona je od tada sama. She goes then, first of all, let's go back to, from Narbonne to uh, Monnier, it's very far, it's also 270 kilometers. Did she take a boat there to Marseille? We don't know. Anyhow, she comes to live in this sort of village, where she, the girl, being meant to be aristocratic and elegant, girls in those days, I was very amazed to find it, they were from high families, they learned Latin, they learned to play music. They could read partition the music. They were gems that were really educated to be attractive, cultural women. You cannot say they were emancipated, but they were smarter and more cultural than the men who were only thinking about assault and horse, and about fighting, and honor and turning. And she is a girl that here becomes a woman in a primitive society. Although she must have been happy there, because she lives there six years before the Crusaders passed. And because of a, the, the speech of Urban II, the Pope, who said, we go on a crusade to Jerusalem to take revenge on the Saracens, but he has said, you do not, if you want complete release from your sins from God, you do not have to wait to kill the enemies of Christ 
said you're in Jerusalem. This could only mean the Jews. So the entire responsibility for the pogroms historically falls on Pope Urban II. They pass through the, 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 the high valley of Mongeau. It's a valley but it's 700 meters high. And it's ideal for encampment. I showed you the valley, it's, it's very friendly, you could camp there. And I, I've been reading philosophies about violence in asking me how does that violence come about. Now, most of the theoreticians about violence uh, agree that mainly you have two sorts of violence. First of all, the structured military violence, which is soldiers against soldiers, targets against targets. And then you have something that unhappily ex-Yugoslavia knows very well. There can be wars that begin by neighbors killing each other. But they, are, they all agree that the violence from citizens to one each other is the most cruel violence and the most sadistic one. Something prehistoric comes up in people. When they kill people they have known. This is horrible. And this was also the structure of the pogroms. The pogroms were ex-military violence. It was civil violence. It was hating a Jew. So I describe this scene in my book. It's in the midst of the book. I realize it's a horrible scene, but I've, I've, I've read a few of those uh, um, testimonies about program simulations, all this gruesome. So there she is alone, and she flees then. Norman Gold, who has um, presented the document, himself says she could not do anything else but go to Marseille. On foot to Marseille, 200 kilometers, Let's say it took her two weeks at least, alone with a child at her breast, a newborn, weeping, starving. So imagine the fact of that woman coming to Marseille. Has she been raped? Has she been beaten? Where has she slept? Thousands of questions. But then I knew she had to take a boat first to Genoa. And from Genoa it was a boat to Palermo. And from Palermo, where it was full of the armies of the Normans, because the Normans were lost of Sicily. So extremely dangerous for her. So she goes to Sicily and there she had a straight line. Let's say maybe she had the, the, the financial possibilities. In a straight line to go from Palermo to um, uh, Alexandria. And from Alexandria to Fustat. Fustat was the former career. So now look, this is indeed in the other direction, what refugees do these days. So then I thought, I'm not only writing a book about my neighbor girl in Provence, I'm not only writing a book about the 11th century, there's a mirror in our time. What did such a girl do? And then she comes in Egypt, and you know as well as I do, when we take a trip to Egypt, in the first week you have a big chance to have diarrhea or be vomiting, because it's not a bacterial material. If brushing your teeth can give you that. After a few days, you recover because you take a little pill. There were no little pills. Did she have dysentery? Did she have typhus? How oh, did she survive? Was she still alive? Did somebody else there when I drink the Genitza? You don't know. So everything I did was trying to imagine her life on the basis of research. But of course, you must count that at each turn of the page, I have been making um, my own conclusions from the research I have been doing. And it can have been different. But at that point I thought, let's tell this life of the girl as if I had known her. As if it's a personal story. To je čini se važno, silno važan moment u romanu. Dakle, pročitali ste jako puno knjiga, gledali se na vašem sajtu, bibliografiju, dakle, sve one knjige koje ste pročitali da bi sklopili sliku svijeta, sliku Evrope, sliku svijeta 11. stoljeća. Međutim, svako toliko vaš narato se pita koliko sam blizu došao toj ženi, Hamutal, Sari Hamutal, Vilis Adelais. Narator joj mora doći, mora je osjetiti srcem. Dakle, to je drugi tip veze. I 
I to mi je, to mi je zanimljivo. Kada ste vi osjetili, ne samo da je ona neki stranac ili neka osoba koja je u 11. stoljeću i njeni motivi su isto zanimljivi, dakle ona odlazi u potragu za svoje dvoje djece koji su križari, otel, što ona vjeruje, vjeruje li da, da će ih pronaći, kolike su šanse da će ih... Zanimljivo je to, kad ste osjetili nju, In fact, your question is about the greatest problem I've had in writing this book. Of course, because I was reading like a fool and, and getting fascinated, and as I told you, every question becomes important. And you cannot imagine, you can put the most silly question to Google, a PhD will come out. If you look well at the, the sites of the universities, it's incredible. Everybody is constantly complaining Everybody gets a superficial by internet. Hello. It's a way of researching. I've done my studies 25 years ago. Doing research now is a gift of God. Everything is there if you look well. If you know how to ask to Google, it will answer you. So, I was reading and reading and reading, and I think at the end I had more than three meters of books read about this story. So the seduction was to make a book of thousand pages and tell me what you think I had found. But this would have been an encyclopedic book in which I would have had this generosity, so to speak, to tell you all. But then I would have lost the girl. And in answering your question as directly as I can, my fantastic lecture in Amsterdam said at a certain moment, because I was desperate and saying, I don't know how to manage, she's so huge, she's so great. I, I, I counted the most important historic moment in, in, in Western Europe in telling me to tell something about my village. And then my lecturer said to me, Stefan, you have one thing to do, fall in love with her and protect her. And then I thought, okay, I'll be big male. Let's be the big male of Hamuta. I create a statue and I hope she will come to life. And there were little things that helped me, of course. When I knew she was Scandinavian, I saw the blonde girl with the blue eyes, and then I thought, I'm going to let her squint a bit. I had no women squint slightly. <laughs> you never know whether they're looking at you or not. <laughs> Very erotic. <laughs> but of course, at the end, she squints like an animal, because she's mad, and she's suffering, and she's dying. So each of the detail helped me to imagine her. And there were certain moments that I got obsessed um, I did a lot of those travels together with my wife and she knew that I was in fact looking for stones that I could touch. Which stones are there still that she has touched? In which church or crypts can you go? That was already there. For instance, the crypt of the church in Clermont-Ferrand, where we know that Pope Urban has been praying before he preached the faith crusade. She has been praying, I guess because she passed that moment. So then you think this poor girl has been here six years before the Pope, who will decide of her fate, passes here too and prays to God. So little by little by little it began a move in my head. And I began really to see her and wanting to protect her. And still knowing that I could not protect her, that what has happened to a woman in the 11th century, a woman alone, who has a blurred identity. As I tell in the book at certain moments, this blue-eyed blonde girl says, I'm a Sephardic Jew, hello. How did they react? I knew that for instance in Cairo, she could find refuge with the Fatimid Muslims. The Muslims at that time, it was a highly um, cultured period in the Muslim culture, and they protected the Jews. The Jews paid for the ceremonies, etc. So they would never kill a milking cow. So there was quite great peace with the, in, in Cairo, in Fustat, with the Jews and the Muslims together. So I knew there I can let her try to lead a new life, which I try. But then you can ask me why I imagined that she runs off again. And then I, of course, because I live near Brussels, where we see refugees, where we see their lives, my wife and I, we know people who, who every day take in refugees and try to give them a place, even if they don't get asylum from the Ministry of Politics, that there are people with a great heart trying to help them. 
So they're also personally involved in this sort of peak. And then I thought, once on the run, always on the run. As he runs away again in the Cairo, because of course I knew there was a second manuscript. 20 years after the discovery of the manuscript that inspired my book, a second manuscript was translated in Tel Aviv. Where they find a, man a manuscript, TS 32, 150, something like that, that speaks of a woman and says that woman, that woman, they never name a name, um, who had a man killed in Sarago, was put at the stake. They wanted to burn her in the north of Spain in Achaia. Why? We don't know. There's a good reason she was a converted Jew. And she is bought free for 35 gold dinars when she's already burning. They get her from the state because a man who is named in that document, which is for 70% destroyed. So the scraps of the words we see. But we can read that she was uh, head from the state. She was saved by a man named Jan Tovnarboni. That's the Jewish sir from Narbonne. Somebody from our family. And how do we know that's probably it's about the same woman? Because it's the same handwriting. It's the same sort of uh, um, document. Um, it's not papyrus, it's a uh, um, it's an uh, animal skin. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's back on Thank you. A parchment, as we say in English. So, in Tel Aviv, they conclude it's the same girl. And underneath, we see Cross, Jacob, Cross, Justa, the name of children. So we are 90% certain that the second document is also about her. But then, the people at the University of Tel Aviv decided that means that she doesn't come from Monnier in France, but from Monnier in Spain. Which I, in my book, try to contradict. Because I think there's no possibility she came from a, a city near to Bourdieu. Because I was on the road to Compostela. She would have been killed a long time before. So I stick to the theory of Monnier. But the second document gave me the opportunity to write the second part of her life. And to imagine what it happened to her. The second document says that after midnight, when she was freed from the stake, she fled. Imagine that poor woman, midst of the night, going off again, having lost everything. She was, in fact, destined to become a woman, like in the, you know, the literature of the troubadours, La Belle Dame Sans Merci. And look what became of her, because out of passion, she says no to her faith. And I've always been obsessed by Antigone. I've even made my PhD on Antigone, etc. And I thought, she's some form of Antigone. And she will pay for her love. That's what she does. No, but that's Fustat. There are some remains of the old town of Fustat. The, um, the Caliph has destroyed it himself. They burned their own city when the second crusade came on. They preferred to burn it themselves because falling in the hands of the barbarians from the north, as they say in the Arabic documents, was so cruel that they preferred to burn it down themselves. And 50 years later, they begin to uh, erect the city of Cairo. But she was in Fustat. And then she was in Ahera. And then she goes back to my beautiful village where you have to read the sad end of the girl, if you want to. On što ste malo prije rekli, dakle, opisali ste taj nevjerojatan put jedne žene koja je, mislim, prošla sve ovo, dakle, od Francuske do Kajra i nazad do Španjolska. Zatišemo je na lomači, oslobađaju je, otupljuju je i više dokumentata o njenom životu nema. Uh, nisu je ubili niti nasilje, niti uh, uh, banditi, uh, niti pogromi, niti bolesti. Uh, nju je na kraju, njoj se na kraju događa i možda je lomi finalno 
upravo takvu odvojenost o kojoj govorite. Ona je osoba između jezika, osoba između imena, ona ne zna je li je li Sara Hamutal ili Vigdi Sadelajs, osoba između religija, ne znam kojeg se Bogu moli. Ona je čisto utjelovljenje podvojenosti. Da, pričali smo malo prije i kažete, u njenom vremenu ne postoji koncept koji bi joj to objasnio, ne postoji Freud da je riješi da je riješi dileme, ne postoje riječ, ne postoje izraz. Hoćete nam reći malo nešto o tom dijelu, na koji način je ona mogla preživjeti taj tip, taj tip rastaganosti? Yes, so we're talking now about the terrible silence. Some attentive readers come and say to me, you know, it was only when I read the book for the second time that I saw that she does not speak one word. And still, I have the impression that I've lived with her, I felt her anxiety, I've been in an insomnia with her, I felt her pain when she was raped, I felt her sadness, and you don't have to speak a word, why is that? My answer is, because there is this terrible silence about this girl, why would I have the psychological banality to lay modern words in her mouth? I do not have her language. I do not know. She babbled and babbled maybe in four languages at the end, because everything was fucked up and mixed up in her head. And as you say there, when we talked about uh, this evening uh, earlier, there was a moment that I realized she couldn't say, I am frustrated or I am traumatized. There was no vocabulary for that. There was even no language for somebody who changed religion. She first had to say God to the God she was praying to. And then she cannot even pronounce Yahweh, because a Jew cannot pronounce the name of Yahweh. You must say Adonai, the Lord. And she's being told Hebrew, and very probable in the 11th century, Aramaic. Christ also spoke Aramaic. So I can't even fathom what happened to her, how she spoke. And still, I give you my intimacy with her fate. So, I think this is why at the end something very tragic will happen. She get mad. Because I think she cannot cope with this. She had no language for what happened to her. And this is a sort of intimate gap in the book. It's what Gilles Deleuze would have na named a ply. That's plies in a story. Like the texture of the Madonna skirt. And that's plies. And it's only because you know there are plies, there are moments that you don't understand, that the story becomes so intense. That's what Gilles Deleuze says in his theory of the ply. How do you know that it's not sheer uh, color, like in a Warhol painting, but that it's the skirt of the Madonna? Because there are plies. Without plies, no meaning. So you need hidden parts in order to know that the story was true. If I would invent her in the classical let's say, or in the Hollywood way, sorry to say, that I would do as if I knew everything about her. But in fact, I want you to suffer with me. And that's why she will not leave you when you read the book. She does not leave me either. She's still with me. I can't forget her. Because there is something in her fate that we will never know. And the only thing I do is a conjecture of how it might have been, and how it is for many people crossing the Mediterranean now, about which I do not want to moralize, but just make you think how it might be for those people. Mi imamo te dvije priče, imamo priču o Hamuta, imamo priču o vašem narratoru koji je prati. U takozvanoj običnoj fikciji pisat će unaprijed znati gdje se te dvije priče dodiruju, u vašem romanu događa se nešto drugo. U vašem romanu stvarnost probija, da je tako nazvano, i rješava, ispaja te dvije priče na kraju, stvarnost koja je nestvarnija od fikcije, zapravo čutnija od fikcije. Što se dogodilo? Kako su se te dvije priče? Želite da nam reći ili možda da ostavimo to? Ne znam je li to suspens, ali mislim da je zanimljivo kako se dvije priče ispaja u njih. 
You mean the story of my finding? What, yes, what yes, 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 yes. And the story of her life? Yes. Yes, there was a double narration. And as I said in the beginning, um, the double narration is because you live with me the making of and the making believe. You know, there's a wonderful thing in literature theory which we call a suspension of disbelief. That's when I'm telling you something that's completely unlikable to happen, but you believe me, because I tell the story in a good way. That's literature. So there are moments when I even play with that. Um, I gave you the example just an hour ago, I will repeat it. I thought at a certain moment, of course, this is a young couple in love. When did they make love for the first time? Not in the first week. She's so timid. She's a Christian. She's hybrid. She's full of guilt. She's not in the mood for sex. Maybe not even in the second week. Where would it be? In a barn? In a ditch? They're both of high descendants. He's a high-born Jew. She's a high-born Christian. So there will be very many limitations from them before they become physical. They are also innocent. They don't know what we know about sex. So when it happens to them, it just happens innocently. But very many of us know that the first time we had sex, because we were so unknowing, it burned like a hot fire Because you think, what is happening to me? What is happening to my body? She doesn't know her body in that way. Or not as we know. So I write this sex scene when they already, it's a bit of a joke, when they already a country where Proust spent his youth. So I then in the village of Proust. You have to say hello to other colleagues sometimes in the booth. And then a few years later, I drive at 30 an hour, I drive past that wood. And I say, silly enough to my reader, I pass now the wood where they made love. But of course, we don't know whether the wood was there or not. Maybe there was no wood there. We don't know. But the suspension of disbelief is so nice to play with and to say to you, Imagine you and me together, as I am not the all-knowing author. Let us try to imagine how it happened, without saying that it passed this way. Maybe it was different, but I hope that the way I had to make love for the first time, that you see that it must have been something cosmic for them, just because it's a road novel at the moment. And they're happy there are things happening on the way which are horrible as well with that horrible, great guy. And so I play with the most Nabokovian way of literature by telling you, don't trust me, but believe me. Sejde mi rekao da smo došli do kraja našeg vremena, a budući da mi vjerujemo Seju, Stefane, sve. Ja ću te ovdje još samo jednu stvar za kraj, budući da volim prekostiti ponekad Seju, pitati u preporuci koju Hamutar dobija od starog rabina, kad je šalje na put, stoji ljubite i vi pridošljice, jer ste i sami bili pridošljice u zemlji Egipatskoj, dakle u Lomak iz Starog Zavjeta, koliko je on aktualan danas kad gledamo ovo što ste prepoznali, dakle gledate Evropu 11. stoljeća i gledate Evropu 21. stoljeća, gledate puno migranata, na puno načina ste ta dva vremena koja su, čije su razlike samo razumljive, ali su sličnosti nas uvijek rapiraju, pokazali ste da živimo u sličnim vremenima. Koliko mislite da su te riječi koje je Mopadija nju šali u svijet važni danas nam u Europi? Hvala da je u Irakom. Moja žena i ja imamo boj u Irak u Irak u apartamentu. Ti je bilo kao da je sada. And he still does not have his allowance to stay. His cousin has been killed. And what must happen more before rude, crude, populist politicians let those people stay in a country where they believe that they will help them? So it's something that is very deep in me as a sort of rage against what is happening. Um, and the same helplessness. And 
In fact, the whole question of how you behave to people, in this respect, I'm very Kierkegaardian. Kierkegaard has somewhere said, your morals, your ethic, conscience, go so far as you can go on foot. You will see what you need on the street, and that will be your test for your morality. If you see a highly pregnant woman in the rain, in a park in Brussels, in the mud, and you take a telephone as a police officer because you think she might be a terrorist, then you have lost civilization. And I, I'm not naive. I know about what's happening. I live in a city where there were terrorist attacks. I've been writing my Antigone in Molenbeek, which is also translated in uh, Croatian. So I know what's happening. And I know that we don't have one solution, but it's very, very complex. But the idea of the rabbi in the letter reflects for me, and I come back to my Antigone story, the conflict between King Creon, who says, we shall not bury the enemy of Thebes, while he took up the army and arms against us. He's a traitor of the country. And she who says, but I, obey an older law, an unwritten law, the agrata nomima, as she says in Greek. And I will burn him because he's my brother. So there we come in a sort of moral, um, sort of dark, where we don't know all too well how we should behave. What is pity? What is taking up somebody? What is your hospitality? What is your generosity? Where are you afraid that they will take profit of your generosity? Where do you close your door or do you open your door? I wrote a letter um, two years ago, a letter to the European Parliament, um, where I asked if you want to defend the European values, as every populist party is crying out, Europe is going to pieces. Islamic terrorism is going to destroy us, all that sort of apocalyptic nonsense. Um, what were they going to say? Is in fact against the spirit of Europe. Because defending Europe is old values. What were the old values of Europe? Read your literature. It was hospitality. It was charity and solidarity. And now they say you're extreme left if you say we need solidarity. So all these people saying we're going to save the Christian Europe from barbarians, become barbarians in order to, to protect it. There's some sort of inner, absurd, a controversial idea in that, that if there is a chance to destroy the European values, it comes from within. That's from without. Thank you. Yeah, breakfast.